We are privileged to have the presence of Srimati Arundhati Bhattacharya. I am a great admirer of her hard work and achievements. I had the privilege to be a board member of SBI Capital Market, where she was the chairman. She had a clear vision, was very professional in her approach, and hands-on on the issues. Though she was hard-pressed on time, then with major challenges facing the economy and the bank, but she has great time management skills. Arundhatiji is the first woman to chair the State Bank of India, a 210-year-old institution, India's largest bank, and a Fortune 500 company. Currently, she is also the chairperson and CEO of Salesforce India, a cloud-based SaaS company listed in the USA. She had faced many challenges in her career, but admirably, she contributed as a daughter, wife, and mother to her postings in various departments of State Bank. Just to mention about her last posting, as church person of SBI, she contributed and showed the forward path to the public sector banks towards opening the Jandhan accounts for several crores of Indians who were deprived of the banking facilities. Next, she admirably handled the demonetization scheme of the government. It was a Herculean task. The Reserve Bank and the Government of India looked forward to State Bank of India and Mrs. Bhattacharya many a times to bail them out. I remember RBI kept on issuing circulars every few hours, and it was under her leadership which made the life of common men a little less miserable. Another feather in her cap was the merger of SBI subsidiary banks into SBI. The RBI and the Government of India had been planning for this merger for several decades. But it was finally under her leadership that a smooth merger and transition took place. The icing on the cake of her career was perhaps her autobiography, her book titled Indomitable, a working woman's note on life, work, and leadership. Madam, I have no words to express my gratitude, and so very kind of you to come. Thank you. Now, coming to the event of the evening, to celebrate the life and work of my mentor and friend, Nani Palkiwala, I borrow the words of C. Rajagopalachari, former Governor General of India, who referred Nani as God's gift to India. Nani was not just an eminent constitutional expert and legal savant, but corporates are eminent diplomat, orator non peril, prolific author, political philosopher, and spiritual visionary. In essence, he was the conscious keeper of the nation, and his story is an inspiration to all. Born on this day in 1920, Nani hailed from a humble middle-class working family, Parsi family, and I'm very honored that the family members of Nani and the Nani Palkiwala Memorial Trust, Mr. Malegam and Statira and Babsi, they are gracing the occasion. 
Determination came early to Nani as he faced many challenges. When confronted with writer's cramp, he took the help of writers to complete his university exams. One of these was Nargesh Matbar, who later on became his better half. She was herself a very distinguished advocate and a great support to Nani. Nani went on to become a prolific writer and author, covering a wide gamut of issues close to his heart. His magnum opus, The Law and Practice of Income Tax, published when he was just 30, remains a Bible for tax professionals. Many of you are here. Other bestsellers, We the People and We the Nation, enunciate his profound and passionate views on a range of public issues. Furthermore, as a child, Nani had a stutter. However, he came, overcame his speech impediment and went on to dazzle the world with his eloquence, just like Aristotle and Winston Churchill. Over the years, Nani grew in strength and stature as an orator. What's more, he spoke with fearlessness, irrespective of the party in power, with the ability to reel out facts, figures, and comparative statistics without any written notes, unlike what I'm doing now. His views on a variety of social, economic, and political subjects remain as relevant today as they were first expressed. He was best known, of course, for his legendary budget speeches delivered to household stadiums here outside for nearly four decades while the finance ministers came and went, the nation's date with Nani remained unchanged. His budget analysis is a calendar event not to be missed. Interestingly, the tremors of his speech generated would be felt in the Dalal Street with the stock market seeing instant corrections. Even the officials at the North Block would get into a huddle the next day with the finance minister holding discussions on Nani's observations and recommendations. Dr. Manmohan Singh, who served as the finance minister from 1991-96, incorporated several of Nani's suggestions made over the decades. He, in a lighter vein, once said, though the credit goes to me, but actually these are Nani's suggestions I am implementing. And in 2004, then Prime Minister of India, Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee, while releasing a postal stamp to commemorate Nani's 84th birth anniversary, said, quote, it used to be said that he is the best law minister that India never had. It was also said that he was the best finance minister that India never had. If Nani had been the finance minister, he would have probably delivered the entire budget speech extempo in Parliament with complete data without needing to refer to the written text. In court two, Nani would hold his audience, both admirers and adversaries alike, in thrall. Courtrooms would be jam-packed on the days of his arguments. Citing the relevant sections, subsection, and case laws, both Indian and foreign, from memory, he would present his case with unfailing courtesy, irrefutable logic, and incomparable lucidity. In fact, such was his magnanimity that if the opposing advocate was struggling with citations, Nani would help him out. And the judges, who too would inevitably fall under his spell, would take time off 
before pronouncing their judgment. Nani's silent contribution to the corporate sector is as significant Nani's, sorry, Nani's silent contribution to the corporate sector is as significant as his much lauded contribution to the civil liberties. Business doyen Mr. J.R.D. Tata initiated Nani into the corporate world. Nani reciprocated the trust repost in him. To cite just one instance, by founding Tata Consultancy Service a little-known fact. Another lesser-known fact is that Nani was the founder chairman of TCS, a division of Tata Sons then, for nearly 30 years. TCS was founded way back in 1968, and much later, in 1995, Mr. Ratan Tata succeeded Nani as chairman of TCS. I'll just give you one example. When Mr. F.C. Kohli came uh, four years back to uh, speak on the subject, he said, Nani used to take me for four weeks in a year to market TCS. I'm talking about early 70s. And when he used to pitch for the case, obviously the client would come to us and my team and I delivered. But whenever we had problems, we used to go to Nani, and he, though he was not a computer person, but he used to solve the issues very admirably. Interestingly, the market capitalization of his brainchild TCS in 50 years of inception is twice than all the Tata Group companies put together. And Nani's effort inspired other indigenous software giants like Infosys and Wipro. It's truly fascinating how the mind of Nani, in fact, was nothing less than a supercomputer itself with the ability to store and sort data and the gift of eidetic recall. The value of Nani's mind did not go ignored. Even amongst the politicians, he censured without fear, favor, or bias. All the prime ministers, from Jawaharlal Nehru to Atal Bihari Ji Vajpayee, sought Nani's services. In 1955, Nehru appointed 35-year-old Nani as the member of the first law commission, and again in 1958 as a member of the second law commission. In 1963, he was invited to be a judge of the Supreme Court, which he declined. Then, in 1965, after the war with Pakistan, the Shastri government appointed Nani when he was barely 45 years as the legal counsel for India in the Indo-Pak Western Boundary Case Tribunal set up in Geneva, popularly known as the Land of Kutch Dispute. When Shastri ji passed away in 1966, Indira Gandhi ji ratified Nani's appointment. Over the next two years, Nani spared no effort in fighting the case on the basis of historical and geographical evidence camping out in Geneva. The verdict in February 1968 saw India being awarded 90% of the disputed 3,500 square miles, and luckily there is peace on that western border. Had Nani been alive, perhaps he would have found a solution to the Kashmir issue also. During his visits to India, Nani briefed Indira Gandhi on the progress of the case 
and their relationship strengthened. In 1967, Indira Gandhi offered him the post of law minister, which he politely declined. In 1968, he was offered the post of attorney general for India, which he accepted, but the next day he later withdrew. Over the years, the relationship between Indira Gandhi and Nani oscillated between mutual admiration and admonition. While he admired Mrs. Gandhi's desire to touch the lives of the poor, her strategic moves that helped the government win the Bangladesh War in 1971, and her courage to make an international statement through nuclear detonation in 1974, Nani was not particularly enamored by her onslaughts on fundamental rights. But above all, both differed in their perception of handling the economy. Gandhi was an advocate of socialistic pattern, which was anathema to Nani, a champion of free enterprise. In India, Nani fought several cases against the Indira Gandhi government, such as bank nationalization, privy purse, and most significant, the fundamental rights of Keshav Nandan Bharti case. It has become again important. While Mahatma Gandhi was instrumental in giving us independence, Nani fought fiercely to preserve our freedom and civil liberties. At the same time, he didn't hesitate for fighting for the government of Indira Gandhi in the international arena, including the International Civil Aviation Organization in Montreal and the World Court in The Hague. He took up Indian case without any fees. Indeed, Nani was always guided by his moral compass. Consider the fact that he took up Indira Gandhi election case in the Supreme Court and won a conditional stay order in her favor. However, when she imposed emergency in 1975, he returned her brief insisting, quote, this is not something that can be discussed or negotiated. Nani's decision to brave Gandhi's breath by refusing to plead her case took immense courage and instantly turned him into a people's hero. He went on to oppose Mrs. Gandhi during the emergency. Many of her close advisors wanted to have him arrested, but she overruled them owing to her respect for Nani. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi also sought Nani's advice on economic matters. And later, Prime Minister I.K. Gujral government awarded Nani the Padma Vibhushan, second highest civilian honor in India. I hope the Narendra Modi government confers Bharat Ratna to Nani posthumously. Now, Moving to a personal note, I seek your indulgence to share my association with Nani. Ours was a relationship akin to the eternal bond of Krishna and Sudama, though there was a generation gap, wealth gap, and wisdom gap, but he gave me a world of affection. I first met Nani as a 19-year-old student of Chartered Accountancy here right in the CCI, when I nudged my way through the teeming crowds at the Cricket Club of India in March 1976 to hear him deliver his annual budget address. To say I was mesmerized would be an understatement. To say I was enchanted 
would be underplaying it. After the speech, I jostled through the crowds to reach the podium where Nani was being mobbed like a rock star, and we had a brief chat. When I sought a personal audience with him, he was generous to invite me. It was the beginning of our association. Nani went on, went on to lend his stamp of approval to many of my books, penning forewords to them. He also urged our common friend, Mr. R. K. Lakshman, to do the covered illustrations. In those days, I was totally immersed in the spirit of socialistic uh, pattern of economy and harbored a bent of mind favoring public sector over the private sector. Though it went against the grain of Nani's philosophy of free enterprise. But Nani always encouraged me, appreciating my determination to not just write my books, but publish them and sell them. Inevitably, our relationship progressed beyond professional association. I requested Nani to come to Jaipur and name my daughter. To my surprise, he made it and named her Savitri. Indeed, Nani was a truly inspiring man, and to really know him was to admire and cherish him. A man of principle and deep, deep humility, he embodied plain living and high thinking, living a fruitful yet frugal life. Self-disciplined, self-restrained, and self-actualized, he was against the single-minded pursuit of material wealth. Life for him was a spiritual quest. In fact, since the time he began his practice, Nani would donate generously to individuals and institutions, long before pro bono publico became a fashion statement. Among the institutions to which he donated was Bharti Vidya Bhavan, to which he donated 10% of his net income every year. And in his final years, Nani bequeathed his worldly wealth of shares worth 51 lakhs and fixed deposits worth 2 crores to Chennai's Shankar Netrale. On 11 December 2002, Nani left for his heavenly abode. That day, a banner flew, flew high on Marine Drive with these words, We the nation, we the people have lost a legend. That day, I lost my mentor and friend, but the memories and motivation, the inspiration and the wealth of knowledge and kinship, they all remain. This occasion is an attempt to preserve and protect them for posterity. I thank you all for giving a very patient hearing. May I request Mrs. Arundhati Bhattacharya to kindly deliver her keynote address. Good evening, uh, Mr. Dharmendra Bhandari and all the other dignitaries present over here today. First of all, you know, it's a signal honor for me to be asked to deliver this, this memorial lecture. And you can imagine uh, how moved I was with it that even a fractured arm couldn't keep me away. Uh, actually, I told Mr. Bhandari uh, that uh, I'm canceling all other appointments 
uh, because uh, you know appearing like this is not in the best of spirits but then this is one opportunity that I didn't really want to miss and it is really an honor for me a signal honor for me that I've been asked to deliver this lecture uh, while you know I can in no way compare to this gigantic titan uh, such as Mr. Palkiwala I take a little pride in sort of following in his footsteps in small ways. Uh, I understand that uh, Mr. Palkiwala actually first majored in English literature from St. Xavier's College in Mumbai. Uh, as you know, I started my academic journey also with a major in English literature from Calcutta. So he went on, of course, to become a noted lawyer and advocate. That is, he pursued the law. But he understood finance just as well as we understand from the budget speeches. And yes, I went on to do finance. And now you've just heard that subsequent to that, or rather alongside of his practice in law, he also dabbled in IT as the chairman of TCS. And in a very small way, I have gone into the IT area as well by becoming the chairperson of Salesforce, which is an IT company. So in some ways, I, it gives me a little satisfaction that, you know, I have been able to take the lessons that this great man left in order to, you know, carry on the kind of work that he was doing. Uh, Mr. Palkiwala actually, you know, was known very much for his courage and he believed strongly that political freedom and civil liberty are the keystones of the Indian constitution. And it was primarily shaped and molded for the common man. When I was the chairperson in SBI, and uh, in my room, I had two inscriptions uh, which were there on both sides of the TV that we had. One of them was Tagore's famous poem uh, that you must all have read, uh, which is entitled, Where the Mind is Without Fear and the Head is Held High. And the other was actually a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that said, that when taking a decision and not knowing whether you are taking it correctly, Quote, recall the face of the poorest and weakest man you have seen and ask yourself if this step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. And if you think it is, then it's going to be the right decision. So to that extent, you know, in reminding myself of these quotes, I hope I lived up to the ideals that Mr. Palkiwala propagated. Mr. Palkiwala, as Mr. Pandari has just told you, was really known as the keeper of the conscience of our nation. And he was arguably made numerous contributions to the legal fraternity and to the development of the political system in India. At the heart of Mr. Palkiwala's success was that he was true to his beliefs, a man of absolute intellectual integrity. A legend because he used his talents to the fullest, and for all the right purposes, he lived for what he believed in by working very hard, respecting the people he worked with, and living his life with absolute grace and humility. Because he was so candid, and also because he was such a powerful orator, Mr. Palkiwala's annual budget speeches were legendary, as you all know, and were held in the very same grounds in which we are you know, the clubhouse we are sitting here today. These speeches became so popular that they actually had to be shifted to this stadium in 1983. And there was no other venue in the city that was large enough to accommodate these crowds. In fact, I understand that the famous cricketer, Mr. Vijay Merchant, once happily remarked, Mr. Palkiwala has brought the crowds back to the Brabon Stadium. Because in those days, with the tests, there were not that many people crowding the stadiums. But perhaps the most important reason Mr. Nani Palkiwala led such a fulfilling life was his lifelong desire to contribute to the community and to the nation. He was a trustee of Sidorabji Tata Trust and Sri Ratan Tata Trust and played a key role in guiding their philanthropic activities. For many years, he was president of the Forum of Free Enterprise, which advocated a progressive, liberal economic agenda for the country. His biggest gift to the nation was undoubtedly motivated by this desire to. 
the victory he won in the Keshavananda Bharti case in the Supreme Court of India, which is even today being talked about, in fact it came in the papers just about three days back I think, was magnificent as he argued continuously and relentlessly for five whole months to protect the citizens' fundamental rights and the basic structure of the Indian constitution. These are the old-fashioned, timeless values that made him a phenomenon. These are values that each of us can take to heart too in our own lives, in whatever way, in whatever fashion we can do. Our nation is proud of Mr. Nani Palkewala and his legacy. He is an inspiration to all of us and to me personally. Let me now switch tracks and talk a little of how I tried to live up to the ideals that he espoused. Firstly, of working for the common man. Second, of communicating well. Third, of fighting for issues that mattered. And last of all, serving to the best of one's abilities in your own journey. I have tried in my book called Indomitable to trace my journey and have attempted to record the growth of India as seen through my eyes from an innocent child to a callow teenager to being a woman in the country's banking sector. As an SBI lifer, I remained driven by a simple mantra which was to leave the bank better than when I took it over. And I hope I did. The bank's change in human resource management affecting the mega merger of the banks into SBI in a record time, driving the financial inclusion agenda and spearheading the bank's digital transformation were top of my agenda for change. However, I always tried to keep my mind and my eyes on the big picture. On the millions of young Indians who hail from small towns and villages of India with stars in their eyes, hope in their hearts and the grit determination and belief that they can excel and contribute to building this nation. The world's eyes currently are on India, the largest open internet market with an unparalleled public digital infrastructure and among the fastest growing consumer markets globally. With an unmatched demographic dividend and a surging aspirational middle class, the Indian market is primed for high growth during this century. India is currently a dollar 3.1 trillion economy. It took India 60 years since independence to become a one trillion dollar economy. But the next trillion dollar was added in only seven years. The third trillion was added in five years. And we are hoping that going forward, we will be able to add a trillion every two years, so that by 2035, we are a $10 trillion economy. According to the report of the Center of Economics and Business Research, this is entirely feasible. Three mega trends, that of global offshoring, digitization, and energy transition, coupled by the deep pool of talent that we have, are setting the scene for an unprecedented economic growth in the country of more than one billion people. And any, if you look at the world anywhere, there is no other country that has the kind of strength in its people, in the entrepreneurial spirit, and in talent and skill as India has. As I said earlier, serving the common man for me was an article of faith. And when the task for doing the Prime Minister Jandhan Yojana, which was the very basis of financial inclusion and growth in the country, when that was launched, a lot of people did ask, is this something that the banks are meant to do? However, as I said, I felt that it was an article of faith for us. For every single account that we procured, the bank was spending anything between 262 to 268 rupees. But in spite of that, the public sector banks persevered. And actually, one third of all the accounts opened, close to almost 1.1 crore accounts were opened by the State Bank of India in seven months' time. There was a difference between the way we did public financial inclusion earlier and the way we did it in PMJDY. 
and what was the difference? First and foremost, of course, was the fact that in PMJDY, we had the jam trinity. The jam trinity is the Jandhan Yojana, which is the count itself, the Aadhaar, which provided us with the KYC, the Know Your Customer, which earlier was not feasible without the technology that was available in order to determine that A is A and B is B. This would not have been possible. So definitely the unified uh, identification authority of India that provided that Aadhaar number was a very big enabler. And the third enabler, of course, was the mobile. Now, why is it that we tried financial inclusion earlier and we didn't get through? And what is it that we do, did differently this time other than the technology enablers? In the initial phases, and we had been trying financial inclusion for, for more than 14 years when we started doing PMJDY, one of the biggest reasons was that we were looking at the supply. That is, giving people the ability to have a bank account. We were not looking at the demand. That means we were not really teaching the people why they needed the account or making it simple and attractive for them to have a bank account. That is the difference that was done in PMJDY where we ensured that we not only gave the account to the customer, we also gave them cards and then taught them that if they swipe their card at least once every 45 days, they get an accident or death insurance for two lakhs. That made it interesting for them to actually start operating the account. Next came the fact that we thought that we would give an overdraft limit if they were putting the money in the banks. And putting the money in the banks also, it's easy to say put the money in the banks, but if a person who is a laborer has to miss half a day in order to go to a bank and then deposit the money, that person is not going to do it. So we not only had to provide them the ability to put in the money, but also the infrastructure to enable them to do that. And the entire network of business correspondence of micro ATMs, which were basically POS machines, all of that enabled our people to really and truly understand that banking is something that can be done easily. It can be done at your convenience because these business correspondents were open at six in the morning when they were going off to their work or at 10 in the night when they were coming back because most of them doubled as either a shopkeeper or a fertilizer dealer or somebody in the village who was important enough for the villagers to know but who were also pursuing other jobs. So to that extent, creation of this entire infrastructure that we did of ensuring that the people really had an access to the banking system and understood that by getting an account, they not only serve themselves, but actually they serve their entire family. Plus, the guarantee of the government that if they had to give any subsidies would come into these accounts actually and truly made this entire program entirely different from the way it was run earlier. When I first completed the program in seven months time, State Bank of India had 97% zero balance accounts. And in fact, a lot of people, including people from the ruling party, were actually asking that is this merely a gimmick? In the next four years time, if I remember right, I was looking into the accounts of State Bank of India as they come out, you know, every quarter. And I found that these accounts at that point of time has as, as much as 16 billion rupees in balances. So to imagine that, you know, we start with zero balance and then get people to actually put their money in so that they can then start leveraging whatever money they have in order to get loans and improve their lifestyles, to have small value insurance to actually be part of the national pension scheme and also to start making small investments. That is indeed great progress. And I believe that you know this is something which the public sector banks, by even setting aside their work for that period, by going ahead and doing this, they have done a great service to the nation by laying the foundation of ensuring that we had the inclusion for the common man. The inclusion for the common man, which was very much something that somebody like Mr. Palkiwala stood for and fought for throughout his entire career. I believe that this is one way in which 
we lived up to the kind of ideals that he gave. Now let us take the second issue of communication. You know Mr. Palki of Allah was an excellent communicator. His oration skills were legendary. And of course, we have heard about the budget speeches, but even otherwise, people hung on to every single word that he said. Now, as a leader, communication is very, very important. And why do I talk about communication? I talk about it because when I went in as the chairperson of State Bank of India, I found that State Bank of India at that point of time was still being considered as a bank of the past generation. Our average age of the workers was 47. And when I took a survey of the average age of our depositors, that too was 47. Now, if you are looking at that, what kind of a future are you looking at? We needed the youth to become interested in us. We needed the youth to be part of our story. And that is when I realized that we needed to have digitization wide-scale digitization, to be able to be part of what is called social media these days. We were not there in social media at all. When I first mooted this idea to my, you know, to my immediate management group, they said, but we already have computerization. We already have internet banking. We already have mobile banking. What more than do you think digitization is about? And I realized that, you know, in order to make people understand what digitization is, I have to actually open a few branches that were so entirely different that they would get this idea. Now, this is, again, very counterintuitive. Because at the end of the day, you are trying to do things virtually, and you are actually opening branches which are physical in order to explain what you were trying to do. But what we did was we took seven branches, in seven of the biggest malls in seven met metros. Those branches looked entirely different. Right in the front, there were only machines, an ATM machine, a cash deposit machine, a check deposit machine, a, passport, a passbook printer, and a multifunction kiosk that did all other banking functions. And these we started keeping open 24 by 7 by 365. So this was a self-service site. Beyond that, in the next hall, there were large screens that were put up. We branded these branches in-touch branches. Why? Because we were trying to get in touch with the younger generation. And everything there was on the basis of touch screens. So if you walked in, there would be a huge trust screen. And you could do anything that you liked on the touch screen in the sense you go in and you touch it, and the, the question will be asked, what would you like to do? Would you like to buy something? And if you say, yes, I'd like to buy a car, it would ask you, is it a new car or a used car? You press whatever you think is right, it would ask you for your budget. And if you gave your budget, it would show you the entire range of cars in that budget, along with what the manufacturer was saying about it, what social media was saying about it. And then it would also ask you, would you like a loan for this? And if you say yes, again, a few questions, and would, it would tell you roughly what is the kind of loan you could get. And then you could play around with how many months that you would repay it in, and check what the interest rates were, and even get a in-principal approval from the system, which you could take to your branch and then get a proper loan. So we did this for housing loans. We did this for um, car loans. And the plan was that we would do it for education loans, for general purpose loans, all of that. Similarly, you know, we had tables that looked like tables out of Star Wars, which had screens and on which you could play with your investment goals. We had little kiosks where you could go in and there would be an expert on the other side of the screen and you could talk to them about how you could invest, how you could take loans. So the entire branch was, is, was a, of a different nature altogether. The people in it were not more than three or four, maximum. And they were dressed in jeans and casual clothes so as to show the fact that we were moving away from one generation of banking into the next. And just by giving your Aadhaar number and one fingerprint, you could open your account. It took us all of 20 minutes to completely open your account and print out a personalized debit card for you so that you could walk out at the end of 20 minutes with a fully functional banking account. Okay? Of course, you know, 
technology has its ups and downs. We did this excellently well, right across. People started looking at these branches. I encouraged my staff to go along with their children on uh, weekends to go and actually play around in these branches with all of these things so as to understand what digitization was about. And there was a real buzz in the bank that yes, things are changing. We are going to look at things entirely differently. But everything has its own pitfall. I remember, for that matter, you know, uh, I wanted to obviously to show this off to the governor of Reserve Bank. And uh, Dr. Rajan was the governor at that point of time. So when everything had stabilized and this had been going on for about five or six months, I invited Dr. Rajan to come to the branch in uh, the Bandra uh, Mall in order to open his account with State Bank of India. And of course, he obliged, he came. We ran through the entire thing, rehearsed day and night for three days. Everything went fine. Okay, And he comes in, he goes through all of it, and then the time comes for him to open the account. He puts in his Aadhaar number, he scans his fingerprint, and lo and behold, the Aadhaar details don't come. So I am totally at a loss, and I call up my Belapur uh, IT center, and I say, what the hell is happening? And they say, ma'am, we are helpless because it's the Aadhaar server that has gone down. So way beyond us. So yes, there are issues, but the fact of the matter is, these are the kinds of ways of communication again. Communication need not always be by words. Communication can be in many, many ways. We also created a blog, internal blog, so that you know I could write for the first time directly to every single person. And one of the things I remember we wrote about is the first of the, of the things that I took up when I came in as chairman, I tried a cost-saving venture because costs, I mean, managing costs is within our powers to do. So I wrote a blog saying that, you know, we need to tighten our belt. Things are difficult for the bank. How can we save costs? And I would like to have your uh, suggestions for it. And I received a number of suggestions. One of them I remember very well. This guy, he was a clerk in one of the branches, and he says that, you know, madam, I came home very late in the night, and as I was coming from the stain train station after my holiday, I found all the glow signs of SBI still on. Why are we wasting electricity? That really sparked something in my mind. So we ensured that every glow sign of SBI got a timer so that it could be switched off at 10 o'clock in the night automatically. But we took it even further. We started doing energy audits for each of our large buildings. And actually speaking, the investors were quite surprised at the kind of cuts we could do in our electricity bills just because we took up this one suggestion and saw it through. So the kind of communications that we tried to develop in the bank either by show and tell or by actually writing, it stood us in great uh, stead during my entire period, even during the, the merger, where, as Mr. Bhandari rightly said, the HR is the biggest problem. The one reason why I think the mergers went well is because I could directly talk to every single person, every single one of our people who were coming on board SBI, and not only that, could have a grievance portal so that they could write to us with their grievances. And there was a time when we were addressing something like 200 such queries on a daily basis. So communication is something, you know, he taught us how to communicate. But by doing the same thing at our level, in our way, there were so many things that we could achieve by purely doing the right kind of communication. Regarding looking at issues that really matter and fighting for them. These are things, you know, not everything that we have is important. Some things simply don't matter in the long run. A lot of people ask me that when I was in the bank and I was called chairman, why is it that I didn't fight for, to be called chairperson? Because the first cards I printed were as chairperson. And then legal sent me a note and told me that in the State Bank of India Act, there is no position such as chairperson. So please scrap your cards and print them as chairman. It's the only way that you will be accepted because that's the only position that is available. I gave in without making a big fuss about it because I didn't think it was worth it. There are too many other things that had to be sorted, that had to be solved. And 
I believe that, you know, if we think about matters, we need to think how these will really impact 5, 10, 20 years from now. And it's apparent that many of the things that we worry about, they are small, and we should instead focus on the big things. So every battle that we take up takes up time. Every problem that you wrap yourself in takes up our time and energy. Even if you win that battle, maybe your time could have been better spent doing something else. We ha all have very limited time on this earth. And ultimately, the reason why anything matters is because we have that limited time. When we look back on our lives, we want to see that what we have done has been meaningful has helped others. And therefore, you know, it's very important to be able to choose your battles. One of the things that I chose to do when I was in the bank was try and look at why the women that were about 33% at the time of joining became only 4% by the time we became senior management. That was something I thought was material and we wanted to look at it. And as we did an informal survey, we found that in India, strangely enough, women leave at certain times of their lives, normally three times in their lives. First, of course, are the childbearing years, which is true the world over. But in India, women also leave when children are between the, between the classes of 10 and 12. The reason is that middle class people are very, very competitive. They all want their children to be either engineers or doctors, and thankfully lawyers also now. But at that point of time, it was doctors and engineers. And for that, you needed to appear for competitive exams. Of course, for becoming lawyers too, you need to now appear for CLAT. So everything is based on competitive exams. And because you are doing your 11 and 12, you're also preparing for the competitive exams. The mother is expected to be around, to chauffeur the child around from coaching center to coaching center, to be around to give the drink of Compline when the child needs, to wake the child up at 3 in the morning so that he can get his uh, homework done. And if they don't do it, and the child doesn't get through, the guilt that the mother has is way too much to bear. And as a result, we found that that was the second period when women left. And the third period when women left their jobs was actually when either parents or parents-in-law fell sick. Many a woman could not bear the fact that their parents-in-law who had helped them in raising their child and who was now helpless and in bed, that they would go away to work, leaving them in the care of the caretakers. And therefore, they gave up their jobs. So therefore, what I did was institute a two-year a sabbatical that could be taken for both child and elderly care. I don't think this elderly care business has been addressed by any other organization anywhere at all, but it's very much a need in India. And two years later, in one of my visits to one of the centers, actually a lady came up to me and told me that, you know, just because of this particular sabbatical, my 20-year career got saved because my mother-in-law was very sick and I couldn't, in all fairness, leave her alone at home. So I actually took the sabbatical, and I went and took care of her. Very unfortunately, she passed away in three months' time. But I have, because of those three months, I would have lost that 20-year career, because I would have resigned if this choice of the sabbatical had not been there. So I think, you know, some of the things that I worked for was for ensuring that the leakage in the women's pipeline did not happen. Similarly, I used to always wonder why there were a lot of girls who came in and did jobs that were not operational in nature. They came in and sat in the training center or in the local head offices, the administrative offices. They were not going out in the field and becoming branch managers. They were not doing their rural assignments. In the bank, again, if you don't do your rural assignment and if you don't do your uh, uh, branch managership, you don't get promotion. Okay? So they would automatically fall back in promotion. So once I asked these girls, why are you taking the easy way out? Why are you not going over there like all these young boys who go in for a rural assignment and take a branch in the rural area. So, you know, at the same moment, they are doing both the rural assignment and their independent assignment. And then they come back and get good positions and they are eligible for promotion. 
And then one of the girls very timidly, she stood up and said, ma'am, it's not the way you think. It's not that we are taking the easy way out. The fact of the matter is that when we go into rural areas, nobody is willing to rent us a house because we are a single woman. That really gave me pause for thought, that I had never given them the, the, you know, the benefit of the doubt and tried to find out the root cause of why they were actually not going in for these assignments. As a result of that, what we did was, in the talukas close to the villages, see if there were five or six villages around a town, we would take one house on rental, the bank itself would take a house on rental, a house with four rooms, say, and then we would put eight women over there, create what we used to say a chamari, create a chamari over there so that they could come and stay there and go to the villages and complete their assignments. This helped a lot of women get past that initial hurdle in a much better way. But the fact of the matter is that these things really needed looking at. Similarly, I fought very hard, though behind the scenes, to ensure that the banking sector got two Sundays off. In return for that, we said that let us have the other two Sundays as full sun, sorry, two Saturdays off. Because the other Saturdays, normally when you come into a bank, whether it is a half day or not, you would end up staying till late in the night. So I said, make it official. Let those two Saturdays be full working days, but let two Saturdays be off. Mainly because, you know, if you consider the women, and being a woman myself, I know, that all of the household work would have to be done on Sunday. And I would come back on Monday more tired than when I left, because there was no, no holidays for us at all. Having two days off, even twice a month, was a big thing for the women in the branches, for the men who were also, who were specially in rural branches and needed to get back to their families in order to be with them every once a week. At least now, every twice a week, it's once in two weeks, they would be able to come back home and stay for 24 hours before they had to make their way back again. So, you know, those were the things that I thought really mattered. Similarly, the bank had a policy given by the government that 4% of its workforce had to be from specially abled people. And there again, while the bank was recruiting these people, no jobs would be given to them. They were literally wallflowers. This did nothing for the bank. The bank was actually employing these people, but getting nothing in return. They were taking salary, but their own self-esteem was sinking by the day. And, you know, it was not serving any purpose. We actually employed an NGO, and I was just talking to somebody over here whose niece helps that NGO called Enable India. What they did was they came into the bank, studied each work stream, and determined where in that work stream a person with disabilities or with special abilities could be fitted in. Trained our, those, those people for doing that particular job, gave them the IT tools that they could do. And I'll give you an example. For instance, at that point of time, in our centers that were opening the accounts, all of the documents had to be uh, you know, uh, photocopied, not photocopied, they had to be uh, digitized. Now for digitizing this, either we could give it to an external agency, but because these were very important documents, they were all done within the bank. Now there was a fully abled person who was doing this digitization, meaning they would put it on a scanner, see that the scanning is coming correctly, and then record it. So we put together a team, one person who was hard of hearing, and one person who could not see. The person could, could, who could not see was the person who was feeding in the papers on the scanner. The person who was hard of hearing was checking to see that it is actually lying correctly and parts of it is not getting taken off. And then he would just press the button. By doing this, believe me, though there were two people, the productivity that we managed was almost three times that of a fully abled person. Because a fully able person gets distracted doing such mechanical work. Whereas for these people, because it is mechanical, they are able to do it. And not only that, it is a matter of pride for them that they are able to do three times the work of a fully able person. In fact, in the year 2016, State Bank got the President's Gold Medal for having incorporated the maximum number of people, integrated the maximum number of 
specially able people into fully productive roles. So, you know, these were things that mattered, I felt. And these were things that I fought for. Because even though they were not something that were coming out in the public, yes, in the public there were a lot of things that the public felt was important. But within the organization, these were very many small things that I undertook. Because again, I felt it is important for us to be inclusive to fight for those who do not have a voice, to actually stand up and do things for them that make a difference. Last but not least, let me give you a little story of how you can do your best. And for that, I chose to talk about demonetization. Now, demonetization was something, you know, that at this point of time, it's a bad memory for all of us. But believe us, for those who lived through those times, those were times that were thing that were, you know, that are unforgettable. So on one of these afternoons, I got a call from the deputy um, uh, governor's office saying that, uh, would you please come at 6.30 in the evening? And of course, the regulator calls, you say yes. We said, of course, we will be there. And what are the papers I'm supposed to take or how should I prepare myself? What's the agenda? And we were told there is no agenda. Now, hearing that there is no agenda and the regulator calling is a very bad thing. Believe me, you don't want to be there because you don't know what is going to be thrown at you and you are obviously very concerned. But anyway, I landed up at 6.30 and lo and behold, I found that every other bank CEO was there. All bank CEOs being called together, all of us realized it has to be something very, very important. So at 6.30, most of the DGs came in and we started talking. And you know, the talk was normal talk, NPAs, where are they, what are you doing, how are you raising capital, where are you, you know, in so many of your other activities. So all of those things were being discussed, the talk seemed normal, there was nothing out of the way, and we were wondering what on earth is happening. When at 10 to 8, a lot of other RBI people walked in, the TV was put on, and there at 8, the Prime Minister came on and declared that in a nation, where 12% of the GDP is in cash, 86% of that would be invalidated in another four hours. And that we would be required to exchange all of these notes in the next 60 minutes. Believe me, there was pin drop silence. We didn't even know what had hit us. And then the RBI personnel took out the notes and showed it to us. And as we saw them, we realized, oh my God, even the ATMs will not work because the notes were smaller and thinner than what they were earlier. So all the ATMs go out of the equation. You are left with only the branches. And we realized that every single ATM would need to be recalibrated with a little tiny plastic part, which again is imported, and very little of it available in the country. And nobody knew what would be the time span required in order to get them into the country, and then manually calibrate each ATM in order to take these notes. Now, as each of these things started coming, all of us were trying frantically on our mobile to get our teams together, but the signals were jammed. So nothing, was, nothing could go out of the, uh, of the room at all. I, I, we finished the meeting at quarter past nine. In fact, I could tell every single bank CEO was literally jumping around to get out and get their teams together. But all the instructions had to be read out to us and at 9.15, we left RBI premises. Nobody said anything to anybody else. Everybody was on the phone trying to get their teams together. That night, I had a meeting in my house because my house, again, is very close to the uh, managing director and the deputy managing director's place in Napier C Road. So the chairman's bungalow is very close, so I called them over to my place. We worked till 3 in the night, determining how we would go about this whole thing. At five in the morning, we started video conferencing, calling up people and video conferencing. We created WhatsApp group with two of our layers right below. So I had a WhatsApp group with my MDs and DMDs. My MDs had a WhatsApp group with DMDs and CGMs, and so it went on. So that any message that I would send or anybody would send would reach the front line in just half an hour. Because everybody had groups that they could go it means uh, that would go to the next two layers, and the same message would get repeated. In the first few days, every night I sent a message telling the people that please understand that even if your customers are angry or they make a noise, it's not because 
they feel that you are responsible, it's because they are scared. If they are scared, it is our job to try and ensure that we reassure them that there is no value lost, everything will be replenished, that they just have to wait. But we learned so many lessons. The number of circulars Reserve Bank came up with at that point of time. In a space of 60 days, on a real-time online system, we applied 72 patches. I cannot believe that we did it because now that I'm in the IT system, I know how wrong we could have gone. But we did it because it had to be done. Suddenly, there was a realization that people were coming back again and again with different IDs in order to exchange 4,000 rupees that was allowed in cash exchange across the counter. So the government determined that, you know, we needed to find a way of finding out who is actually exchanging. So the idea that was given is, like in the elections, let's ink their fingers. So the government mooted that, we will ink the fingers. Up came the election commission and said, nothing doing, you can't ink their fingers because we have elections coming up in a few states. Okay? So the government said, fine, we won't ink their left hands, we'll ink their right hands. Great, we can ink their right hands, but where's the ink? The MISO security press said, we don't have so much of ink. Where will you get it from? And then somebody discovered that Amazon has this ink. So that solved one of the problems. Similarly, there was another request that, you know, people going for marriages, they definitely had to have more than 4,000 rupees in cash because there are tips to be given. There are so many other people, you know, who work on cash. So the government told us, okay, you can give 2 lakhs of rupees to cash to any uh, couple. So the State Bank of India, of course, you know, I was quite uh, sort of uh, sympathetic to the cause of people getting married. So I said, fine, no problem, as long as they show you your wedding card, give them the two lakhs of rupees. Another bank came and to raised the question, what happens if the bride comes to one bank and the groom comes to the other? Of course, they will go to different banks. Who said the bride and the groom are in the same bank? They will, but if they take two lakhs each, well, that can't be helped. There is no way that you can, you know, actually correlate the two. And there is no system, there is no database across banks that can prevent us from doing this. And then somebody came with even something further, saying what if they print a false wedding card? Well, they print a false wedding card. How many people will go to the extent of printing false wedding cards? And it's only two lakhs rupees after all. They can do it only once. There were millions of such issues, but these were the smaller issues. Actually speaking, if you look at the logistics of it, okay, if you look at the sheer logistics of giving out these notes, at that point of time, we as the heads of the bank didn't know where the notes were because the Reserve Bank of India had got our cash officers in charge of the currency chess branches. Basically, we are agents of the Reserve Bank. So the in charges of the currency chess branches are bound to listen to what RBI says. They had been made to sign a non-disclosure non, um, agreement, an NDA, to not reveal to the bank that they were having new currency notes. So when I went out at 9.15, I didn't even know where the currency notes were. So first and foremost, we had to determine where were the notes and then determine how we could get them out into our 24,000 branches. And on top of that, SBI also funds the 100,000 post offices and myriad other small banks, especially in the, in the Northeast and many other difficult areas. So managing all of this is much more than a logistical nightmare. Because cash is not something that you can stuff in your pocket and walk across to the next branch. For moving cash, you actually have to advise the police, you have to get a route clearance, you have to get security, and only then you can move cash. How do you do it? Who comes and collects? Who goes and gives? All of that to determine the ability to push out these notes in that one day holiday that we had later. It is probably one of the largest logistical exercises ever done in India. And we have never really thought it through as to how it got done. Actually speaking, there was a tragedy there as well. And that really was something that really made me, you know, really made me take pause. At three in the morning, on the way back after distribution of cash, one of our cars overturned on the Kanpur Lucknow Road. And all eight people lost their lives. Now, in all probability, the person must have fallen asleep at the wheel. But you couldn't blame them because they had been distributing, uh, distributing cash through the day 
It was three in the morning when it happened. So things like that happen. But the fact of the matter is, in spite of everything, I would say that demonetization went through with very little trouble. There was no looting. There was no rioting. Remember, in the rural branches, we had the minimum number of people. We had two or three people per branch. And the maximum number to serve. Because in the rural areas, the numbers are far more. In the urban areas, at least, you know, the numbers of people serving the people in a particular locality, if you look at the proportion, would be much bigger. In the rural areas, not so. There were actually queues five kilometers long, till we learned that there are only this many people that we can service per day. So what we did was, we would give tokens for the number of people we could service per day. And then we would give tokens for the next day's date to the rest of the people and tell them, you line up next day and you will be served. So that nobody who would not be served beyond that day would be unnecessarily standing in the sun and bearing the you know, difficult times that we were in. But so many things were done at that point of time. You know, So many innovations came about. We learned how to reverse the post transactions. For instance, in the Mondays, we were told that farmers were being taken for a ride because vegetables and things like that, which are perishables, if they cost 30,000 rupees, the Mondi owners would say, we only have 10,000 in cash. You want to take it, you take it, otherwise you go home. The farmer would take it because otherwise his perishables would actually perish. He would get nothing. So what we did was we started, we created a way in which by swiping his card, the Monday owner would be debited and his account could be created so that he could get that 30,000 rupees. Because the farmers didn't want to take checks, they didn't believe in checks, and I can understand why. But so many innovations were, were done during that period of time. I would say that, you know, this concept of trying and doing the best possible in any circumstances, I think the entire banking sector at that point of time stood up and delivered for the nation, for what was required. I am not talking here about the goods and bads of what it was, but the fact of the matter is the banking sector delivered, and I think we need to really understand the kind of issues that we faced, including transporting of notes by military helicopters, by doing all kinds of things. But the entire banking sector, including the Reserve Bank of India, the way they printed those notes was crazy, but they did it, and they delivered. So I think, you know, if we are looking at the ideals of people like Mr. Palkiwala, there are many such instances where we have tried and lived up to those instances. Because there were people like him who showed the way, who felt that they were the conscience of the nation, and who spoke the truth, and who showed us the way. Okay? I would now sort of, you know, like to sort of sign off by just talking about one or two of my realizations. One is that the path to success is seldom linear. What matters is your grit. As you heard, Mr. Balkiwala had his own reversals in life, but it was his grit that saw him through. This also takes me back to my college days, when I used to give tuitions to two girls in Alipur, an upscale, posh neighborhood in Kolkata. It captured my fancy. And in fact, I used to stand at a bus stop that was right opposite State Bank of India. And very often, I used to wish that I could be an employee of that bank. And that came true, by the way. And by the way, my first posting also was the same branch. All right. Had I known back then that many of these households, and the households of the uh, people in Alipur are the, all the Goenkas, the Mittals, the Billas, and the others, that they would, at one point of time, be my customers. Perhaps then I wouldn't have given much thought to my moments of self-doubt. It's a realization that comes to me now. So fast forward to today, and the lesson is crystal clear. You need to believe in yourself, and you need to have the courage to follow your dreams. We shouldn't also take ourselves too seriously. A touch of humor is worth a million homilies. These are our most valuable tools for life. In moments of doubt, I look around for inspiration, as I'm sure you do. There are many stories that can light up a flame and inspire you to do more. In fact, if I go back to the times when I have sought inspiration, many a times I have flipped through Mr. Palkiwala's books and the quotes that were his. When I used to look up at one of his quotes, there was always something there that restored 
my courage, and not only that, it would bring a smile to my lips. And I would therefore like to end with one of such sayings of his, not a quote, but one of his sayings. He said that in India, a lawsuit once started is the nearest thing to eternal life ever seen on this earth. Okay? If litigation were to be included in the next Olympics, India would be quite certain of winning at least one gold medal. Now only a person who practiced in the Supreme Court and had the ability to laugh at themselves would be in a position to say this. I take my cue from him. We need to have that view of life which is true, which is eternal, and which is at the same time, which doesn't sort of, you know, it is not filled with, uh, with your own ego, but it is filled with something that really grounds you, that really, you know, keeps you at a point where you, with, with full humility, you can understand that, yes, this is what I can do, and this is what I can't. But at least one thing I can do is to live by my values. So thank you ever so much for being so patient and listening to me. It has indeed been a pleasure, and I hope you have been able to enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arundhati Ji. And I'm also very grateful to all of you who have turned up at a very short notice. Arundhati Ji mentioned about serving the common man. I'll just tell you one instance. Another of my very close dear friend, Mr. R. K. Lakshman, I used to invite him to Mumbai quite frequently for a holiday. So one day he said, let's go to your friend's office. I was taken aback. I didn't know where to take him. And incidentally, I telephoned Arundhati ji, can we come to your office? She said, most welcome. And she gave a red carpet welcome to both of us. Thank you. I still remember that day. And I can now take the privilege of calling her also as my friend because in spite of all the pains and other things, you've been so kind and generous to come. I thank all of you. And one thing, you need to take one of my gifts, a book either on R.K. Lakshman or Common Man uh, on Nani Palkhiwala before you go. So please just don't immediately go. Take a book, have some drinks and dinner. I request Madhu and Hema to just come and present. The other thing she mentioned that she had a quote of photo of Mahatma Gandhi ji at the at her office and Rabindranath Tagore. So I didn't know about that, but the gift I am going to present it to you is done by Mr. R. K. Lakshman of Ramindranath Tagore, so I am sure you will always cherish it. May I request Tatira and Mr. Malikam, member of the Nani Palkhiwala Memorial Trust, to kindly join us for the cake cut.